just for kicks at some point, I counted how many hits every neck gets. It's around 8,000. That's Kim Bach of KB Sax in New York. Not only is he a phenomenal saxophone player, but he's also a skilled craftsman who makes custom saxophone necks by hand from scratch. I visited with him at his workshop earlier this year and he was kind enough to allow me to film the entire process, which is fascinating. I've got one right here that I've been playing on for a while, so later on I'll do a play test comparison so you can listen and let me know if you hear any difference or improvement. Jay Metcalf here from bettersax.com. If you enjoy my on location saxophone videos like the one you're about to watch, do me a quick favor and drop me one of these right now and also consider subscribing to the channel. It's important to point out that these KB Sax necks are different from many of the aftermarket necks available these days. These are truly handcrafted by the designer himself. It's not an Asian import with a different sax shop's brand stamped on it where you choose your tenon size from a drop-down menu. The entire process is very labor-intensive and done by Kim Bach himself in-house with materials sourced in the United States. The first step is a customer orders their neck. You may recognize a few of Kim's existing customers. Kim sends them brass gauges to get the exact size of their neck tenon. This ensures that the neck will fit the customer's saxophone perfectly when it's done. And then when they get the gauges, they put them in. Oh, this came in very easy. So they go up one size to the 87. Oh, that's a good tight fit. You want to make sure you have the one size that... Ah, see, that one will not go in. That means that it's the one just before that's it. That's the perfect size for it. The neck tenon size is determined within one one thousandth of an inch accuracy, and then your custom neck begins to be built from scratch. This is how it all starts. <laughs> the next step is to trace neck halves onto sheets of metal. So these are going to be bronze necks that are hand hammered. Bronze is an alloy of copper, and traditionally it's an alloy of copper and tin. A lot of the bronzes that instrument makers use is called commercial bronze, which has no tin in it actually. It's not nearly as hard, but this is like a traditional bronze. It's alloyed with tin, so it's a very, very hard material. We have to heat it up somewhat in the kiln to ensure that we can uh, manipulate these here. Bit of a puzzle, but I can just get 11 out of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, yeah. Now the neck puzzle pieces get cut out. This next step I can't really show you in detail since it's where all the secrets to the process are hidden. Kim asked that we not show this part to protect his method from others who would copy him. But he essentially shapes the metal halves and then hard solders them together. This process done by a master craftsman by hand is what makes these necks special and sets them apart from a lot of the mass produced but branded saxophone necks out there. Once the halves are fused together, it's time to get the hammer out. That's copper. And the copper necks, I always hand hammer. And we do it for two reasons. First of all, just pure copper is a soft material and it would be more prone to pull down damage. By hammering it, you are compacting the material and you're making it a lot stronger. So there's no risk of pull down on the neck. But the other thing that happens once you compact the metal that way, it becomes stiffer and it actually changes the sound of the neck. You gain more brilliance, the neck is quicker responding. Once the tube is formed like these, we fill them with something called pitch. I think it's tar and wax and something else. At room temperature, it's hard. 
So with the hardened room temperature pitch inside the neck, Kim can safely hammer the outside, making the neck stronger, more responsive, and not to mention super cool looking. Once the 8,000 or so taps are done, the pitch has to be heated up inside the neck until it all slides out. Now it's time to buff and polish the finished tube. Once I've got the tube done, I drill the pip hole, form the brace, get the serial number on the brace, get the brace soldered on, form the octave key saddle with the posts and get that soldered on, the face shield soldered on, tenon goes on, the pip goes on, octave key guide, then I have some shaping of the end of the neck here, get the end ring on. So these posts need to be drilled and tapped. Like on this neck, for instance, I did it already. So this is tapped on this side and drilled through so that we can uh, install the key on it. There's a machine shop in the Midwest that I have cut the pieces of brass like this that are water jet cut. I silver solder on the parts, like the octave key, hinge tube, silver solder that guy in there. So now we got half of the key and then the brass rod I have to bake it for a certain time to make it soft enough that, that we can adjust this one easily. So once it's baked so that it has the right rigidity, I shape the ends. I turn them so that they get a nice point to them at the end. They get bent into a loop shape and silver soldered onto the top part of the key. Then you're ready to install the key. And then it gets a, a final cleaning up and polish and then play test. After showing me how he makes the necks, of course, it was time to play test a few of them. Now, I had taken with me my vintage Selmer Mark VI tenor saxophone on this trip specifically because I thought if I were to find an improved neck for it, I might go back to playing that horn. So first, I warmed up with my original Mark VI neck. <laughs> Then the testing began. I play tested four different necks, comparing them to my original Mark VI neck. What necks have you got? We got the Redwood model. That's a slightly more open. I guess the inspiration came from the actual Redwoods because they're round, they're big, and that's sort of the idea with the sound of that neck. It's still a very focused, very, very strong core in the neck, but it sort of stays in a round shape, very projecting. The Vanguard is the other model I make, and that one is tighter, mm -hmm. and in that sense a little smaller, but very focused, more okay. punchy. Okay, so we have two to try. So we have two general models. Within the models, I use different materials, oh. and the different materials will affect the timbre, the, the, the colors, actual the color of the sound, yeah. okay. and to a smaller degree, also the amount of back pressure that right. you will feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, noodle a little bit. Mm -hmm. The Vanguard takes your sort of the sound wave, your energy, whatever you want to call it, and it packs it into a slightly tighter spot at the beginning of the neck before it opens up. 
Whereas the Redwood model feels like you're playing into a slightly bigger opening, basically. Okay. So that's the feeling of playing the Vanguard versus the Redwood to me. Now, what comes out on the outside can be a little different because right. a neck that's very sort of compacted and focused like this, also with a, with, with a very strong mid-tone presence, really carries the sound far. So if we're playing for these construction workers on the other side, they might hear that tight sort of beam of sound better right. than they would on the Redwood because the Redwood is a little sort of oh, wider see, mode. Okay. The next one I would lay on you would actually be a Vanguard hand-hammered bronze. Okay. The hand-hammered bronze is the brightest one we make, but it's also feeling a little bit more sort of open than the hand-hammered copper Vanguard. Okay. Okay, and now. Yeah. I'll Let's get the mouthpiece on this one. Yes, always put the mouthpiece on the neck first. That's that's the only shop rule we have here. <laughs> Especially if it's not your instrument. That's that. Let me make sure we have a little bit of space here. We were talking about before when I make the keys, I bake this part for a certain duration at a certain degree, and that's what enables me to be able to actually adjust it just like this. to the Vanguard hand hammer copper, this one, you hear more brightness okay. in all the ranges. Okay, should I try another one? Sure. I'll have you play the Vanguard M61 brass. There you go. Yes, if for me, it just feels a bit darker, but in a good way, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, uh, and more focused, less spread. Sounds like that on the outside yeah. to me. Yes. But it feels very powerful and easily controllable and even. Let me go back to the original neck once now. Yeah, it's definitely smaller. And, it, and if I push, I'm not even pushing as much as I was right. before, but the sound is like just it's kind of pushing back. Yeah. And, uh, and kind of causing a distortion. Yeah, it goes a little wobbly. Yeah. Yeah, as, so, as soon as I play like a palm key D or anything, it's like I hit the note and like, oh, I have to adjust it immediately. Yeah. And I, you know, I, in the little time I was playing all of these necks, D was rounder, not as sharp, yeah. and, uh, and more uh, consistent with the other notes. I spent a lot of time on, on that. <laughs> I'm glad that you can feel that. Yeah. All of the KB sax necks, performed better for me than my original Mark VI neck, and they each had their own distinct characteristics. One of the improvements I felt with the KB Sax necks was an immediate access to more power. Basically, putting the same amount of air through the KB Sax neck gets me more sound than that air gets me on the Mark VI neck. Also, if I'm really pushing, the Mark VI neck has a lower ceiling on how much air it can take before it shuts down. The other clear improvement was intonation and tonal evenness in the upper register. The palm keys were especially improved on the KB Sax neck. While I liked the Redwood neck very much, I personally prefer the Vanguard models. I guess it's just closer to my personal sound concept. I think we all experience sound and response from our instrument differently, so I don't want to say too much about the particulars other than to say that I found the hand-hammered necks all offered this 
sizzle to the sound that some might describe as a brightness, but for me, it's more like a liveliness in the sound. We often describe gear in this one-dimensional way of dark to bright, but if you think about it, in reality, a neck like this is playing dark and bright at the same time, and it's the mixture of the different bright and dark frequencies together that gives it its unique sound. In the end, I asked Kim to make for me a Vanguard hand-hammered bronze neck to go with my WO2 Yanagasawa bronze tenor saxophone. I never thought that the Yanagasawa neck needed any improvement, but after playing the KB sax neck on this horn, I really enjoy the new tonal color I'm able to get with this. So I ended up purchasing it and I've been playing on it ever since. Have a listen to me playing my main Yanagasawa horn with its original neck as well as the KB sax neck and let me know in the comments below which one you prefer. <laughs> We do a lot of gear tests on this channel, and it's not always easy to clearly hear the differences. Uh, after all, we all end up sounding like ourselves regardless of the equipment we're using. I think with Next, the differences can be heard easily enough, but they're even more apparent from the perspective of the player in terms of intonation, response, and resistance. In the end, the small improvements I get from playing the KB sax neck on my main horn add up to it being a little bit more fun to play, and for me, that's worth it. For my Selmer, yes, the Mark VI neck can play in tune, and the Palm keynotes can play fine, but it takes more effort to get those results. So my KB sax neck not only makes it more fun, but easier to play. I put a link in the description below to the KB Sax website where you can find out tons more information about what they're doing. Now, this is not an affiliate link and this video is in no way sponsored by them at all. I just wanted to share with you the fascinating process of making these amazing necks by hand. These necks play fantastic and they are now offering them uh, for alto saxophone as well, so I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on one of those. Thanks to Kim Bach for sharing all of your creations with us. Thanks to you for watching, and I'll see you again very soon in another video. Ah, see, now that is a... Yeah, I mean, I could get used to that, too. So for me, that's more Mark VI like you know, that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, I, th I still prefer the other one. <laughs>